Hello, everyone, and welcome back to my series on the book Awareness Through Movement by Moshe Feldenkrais. And hopefully you know by now that I'm reading directly from the book, uh, so you can catch the videos I've already made uh, with the preface of the book and most recently the first chapter in the first section, which is called The Self-Image, and that's what I'm going to talk about today. But just a quick recap, in the preface, Feldenkrais introduced the idea of the self-image there, and it's really the central idea of the entire Feldenkrais method. The book begins with the sentence, we act in accordance with our self-image. So this image we have inside ourselves, which constitutes both our understanding of our physical body, but also something of who we are, how we show up in the world, what our narrative uh, of our life is all about. That's all the self-image, right? And then the book is about how do we essentially live a better life? And he's going to get to a movement practice called Awareness Through Movement, just like the title of the book. There's going to be 12 different movement lessons in this book, but he's setting the stage in these earlier chapters. And also in the preface, he made this really important point that our image that we have of ourselves, it's developed through experience and that experience takes place uh, in society, right? So it's not just me personally, what I think about myself, but I, I live in society, maybe I'm successful in the eyes of society, maybe I'm not, but I'm very aware of that. I'm very aware of kind of how I stack up with other people and that affects how I feel about myself. And in addition, Feldenkrais uh, put forward this idea that we all live behind a certain kind of a mask. And again, <laughs> striking to think about here during the pandemic, but he's talking about how we project what we think um, you know, the way we would like to be seen on the outside. And so, um, but, but that's not necessarily how we feel on the inside, right? So there's a way that we are, by trying to meet society's standards, or at least what we think society's standards are, um, we are not being true to ourselves and we are sort of, you know, putting on a mask. We're deforming um, ourselves and trying to fulfill certain things that are maybe not our most natural and organic needs. So in this chapter on the self-image, he's gonna go more into detail about the self-image, um, how it's created, and again, what is needed in order to improve things. So a sort of a reprise of that first sentence, we act in accordance with our self-image. He says in the first paragraph of this chapter, in order to change our mode of action, we must change the image of ourselves that we carry within us. So he's saying that image has to change if our action is going to change. And then he adds, what is involved here, of course, is a change in the dynamics of our reactions and not the mere replacing of one action by another. Such a change involves not only a change in our self-image, but a change in the nature of our motivations and the mobilization of all the parts of the body concerned. And so what we can see here, he's talking about the self-image related to the body, but also the motivations, the intentions. And then he's going to introduce the four components of action. That's one of the subheadings in the title. And this is where we really see uh, very clearly for the first time that Feldenkrais does not distinguish between mind and body. And that's a very kind of more, much more common idea now but in 1972, when he was writing this book, and even much earlier in his life when he was developing this method, uh, he was really forward thinking in terms of understanding an integrated um, sense of how mind and body are connected. And so the four components of action are movement, sensation, feeling, and thought. And the point is that you're doing all four of those things at all times. And you can listen to me reading the chapter, but he, he kind of goes one by one through each of these actions or these, each of these elements of action and talks about how you couldn't 
move if you weren't sort of thinking about what you were doing, if you weren't feeling um, in the sense of like, like you touch something and there's, there's a sensory, but also having some sort of emotional state that you're in. All of these things are constantly going on. Okay, so having established that the self image and everything that we do has these different components, Feldenkrais starts to talk about how do we create the self image. And the first idea that he's going to bring forward is that it's a developmental process. So when we're born, we don't have all of our faculties together. We can't control our body completely. There's certain places that we know the world and we begin with our mouth and our lips and then later our hands. So if you think about that, that means those muscles, you know, we have control of them, but how do we control the musculature? We control it from the motor cortex in our brain. So he's describing that certain parts of the brain essentially are online. And if we were to imagine the image of our bodies, we don't do that as babies, right? We, this is an adult concept to, to be able to discuss in a video like this, but if we could, we would know our bodies as essentially being lips, as being a mouth, um, we might sense limbs, but we don't have much control over them. So they, like who we are is more centered in certain parts of our body. And then as we develop, that is going to evolve. So for example, before we can lift our head up off the floor, before we can come upright, all of the muscles that we use to open the joints, the extensor muscles, which are along the back of the body, those, those are, aren't part of our image in the beginning because we're not using them. We don't know how to use them. Now, he also makes the point that we're all different and that this too is going to change um, how my self-image, let's say, is a little different than your self-image. And so he gives some examples here. You have the person who just speaks one language and then you have the person who speaks several different languages. Well, so all of the functions of my body associated with speech from my mouth to, you know, my vocal cords, my breathing apparatus, if I can pronounce the words of one language, if I can communicate in one style of speech, well, I've developed a certain amount. But if I know multiple languages, well, I'm going to have a more rich kind of image there of, of the whole vocal mechanism. Or let's suppose that I'm a musician and I can play the piano. I'm a virtuoso piano player. That means I've got very fine control of my hands that another person who doesn't play the piano doesn't have. I might have a more developed image of my hands. He also uses uh, the example of, he says, the man who knows how to jump and the man who does not know how to jump. And it just simply says, all the parts of your body you need to jump, <laughs> if you know how to jump, those are going to be more developed. If you don't uh, know how to jump, they're not going to be. So in other words, the, the self-image in terms of the body is developed based on use. It's, it's what functions we have. So again, developmentally, we have to add one function, add another, and that's one way our self-image is developing. And then especially in adulthood, we are unique. We have different activities in our lives. So we are developing different parts of the image um, uniquely compared to other individuals. Now, I'll just say briefly that Feldenkrais uh, refers to this idea of the homunculus. And you may have seen uh, these kind of cartoon-like drawings of a little person with huge lips, really big thumbs, the genitalia are larger. And this is a representation of how different parts of the body are unequally sort of mapped into the brain. Feldenkrais says a few things in the text that almost would make you imagine that there's like a little man that you could find on the surface of your brain. And I think we know that's not the case. Um, I will just point out again, this book is written in 1972, um, a recent book by the neuroscientist Norman Deutsch, The Brain's Way of Healing, um, has a couple of chapters on the Feldenkrais method in this book. And 
I'll, I just mention it because Deutsch calls Feldenkrais one of the very first neuroplasticians. So this idea of neuroplasticity, the idea that the brain can change and create new patterns, that's a relatively new idea in science. And Feldenkrais was basically acting on this idea before it was really established and agreed upon. A lot of people sort of thought certain, certain things in the brain are just fixed. You know, when you reach a certain age, there's no more evolution possible there. And Feldenkrais was always very much of the opinion that we can continue to learn and develop new capacities in our brain all of our lives. So just when you read Feldenkrais, keep in mind that, you know, he left the planet in 1984. He began to develop his work in the 1940s, but it's just incredible how much of the basics of what he did see and what he put it in place uh, are totally congruent with uh, more recent science. And so anyway, that's just a little note I wanted to add about this issue of the homunculus. Okay, so coming back to that theme from the preface of how the way we develop is also impacted by society and this idea of the mask, right, that we wear. First of all, Feldenkrais says that the potential capacity of our brains, really the potential capacity of ourselves entirely, it's really, we don't reach our maximum potential. We just, we, we could be capable of so much more than what we actually are capable. And as he laid out in the preface, one of the reasons we fall short is society, education, uh, tends to teach us that once we do certain things, that's okay. We don't need to learn anymore. We don't need to grow anymore. Here's your place in society. You know, you've, you've passed certain tests. Don't bother continuing to develop yourself. But, you know, Feldenkrais is kind of saying that's ridiculous. And he's also saying that he thinks that the potential, if we did develop ourselves, is just massive compared to what we all consider to be normal. Okay, so every individual is different, but then there's also this factor of society and the kind of uh, lower expectations it creates for us. And so he's talking here um, about this problem again, that we as individuals, we tend to value ourselves in relation to society. And he says, there are few individuals who view themselves without reference to the value attributed to them by society. Like a man trying to force a square peg into a round hole, so the individual tries to smooth out his biological peculiarities by alienating himself from his inherent needs. And how does this begin? It begins in childhood. And there's one of the section headings in this chapter that reads, judging a child by his achievements robs him of spontaneity. So as opposed to the baby that everyone loves just because the baby's cute and look, oh my gosh, it's a baby and the baby gets to experience itself as being loved. Later on, um, that child whose parents are really fixed on what is this kid gonna achieve is constantly noticing, did I succeed or did I fail? And then they start to act in such a way that they're just trying to either succeed or appear to succeed, and that's the beginning of the creation of the mask, but whatever it is, it, it isn't spontaneous, right? It isn't just the child doing whatever they would do like a baby does because everyone loves a baby no matter what, and the baby is not getting a sense of right, wrong, but when we grow up, this is what begins to happen. So the family actually is the first experience of society and society's expectations and the idea that what other people think of me uh, should dictate my behavior. So this is all the challenge that we face if we want to change our behavior. And he says that one of the first things, if we're gonna set out on a path of improvement is we actually have to have a positive self-regard that does not uh, depend on what society thinks. So we have to be capable of viewing ourselves positively, even if 
Maybe we don't have a high paying job or we don't have a nice house, et cetera, et cetera, because we have to have some assumption in our capabilities. Now, interestingly, what he says is that later on in the course of development, we're actually going to have to drop the sense of our importance and, and we need to just become more interested in the things we're doing and the quality of those actions. But in the beginning, we really do need to have some positive sense of ourselves. So again, you get this, this kind of interesting sense of like the path to a better life. Uh, it's, it's, it involves a certain perspective that we need. And even that perspective needs to shift as we go along. So the other thing that's really difficult about changing ourselves is we have our habits, right? And these habits are written into that self-image. So remember when I was a kid, there was parts of my body I didn't even know how to use, but now I'm an adult who, you know, is a musician or isn't a musician or does some other particular thing that really shapes my body because the actions I do every day have created certain patterns. And he says the difficulty um, when you're trying to change and create new patterns, the difficulty involved lie less in the nature of the new habit, the new habit that you're trying to cultivate, but in the changing of habits of body, feeling, and mind from their established patterns. So you remember there were these four elements of every action, thinking, sensing, feeling, and doing. And so if I'm trying to improve some kind of physical action, the problem is I have my ingrained way of doing it. And it's not just that I'm ingrained uh, in the particular uh, coordination of my physical body, but it's the fact that when I do the thing, the way I've always done it, I have a certain conception of myself. I, I, there's certain sensations that I'm used to feeling. And so all four elements of the action are, when I'm trying to do something new, maybe all four of those, those elements feel wrong in the beginning. And so to get the point where I can, as I used this example in, in my previous video, if I'm trying to stand up from a chair and do it more efficiently than I used to, it's not only that I have to find a new coordination of my joints and my, my skeleton, but I also have to actually have a different sense of standing up from the chair. Let's say that I have a lot of difficulty standing up from the chair if I stand up from the chair in a new way that's easy, it might actually confuse me. I have to get to the sense of, oh yeah, standing up can be easy. And then that's gonna allow me to prepare to make a movement that feels easy. If I think it's difficult to stand up from the chair, I'm gonna, I'm gonna like, you know, brace myself for a big effort before I stand up. And that bracing is already part of how I create this inefficient pattern that I have. Okay, so at this point, Feldenkrais is going to introduce another very important idea, which for some people, they bristle a little bit at it. But he's going to talk about what would be the ideal. And he uses the ideal in many contexts, but we're still talking about the self-image, right? What would be an ideal self-image? Now, let me just deal with this question of ideal first. Feldenkrais says again and again in many of his books and when he was teaching, no one is ideal. But the importance of defining the ideal is if you know what ideal would be, what would be the ideal way to stand up from a chair? Well, ideally you would stand up and it would feel like no effort at all, right? Well, you stand up from a chair and you feel that there was some effort. But if you stand up from a chair and there was less effort than the last time, you did it, well, you've moved closer to the ideal, right? Something has improved in a way that we can really um, determine in, in, a, in a specific enough manner that just we, we have a sense of whether we're making progress or not. That was less effort. That's closer to the ideal. But this question of the self-image, I'm going to refer again to a bit of the Feldenkrais method in practice because a very uh, common experience Pretty much any time you go to a class and you do awareness through movement is 
regardless of the movements that you explore during the course of the class, you're most often going to begin the class by simply lying there and then doing what we call a body scan, like just feeling all the parts of your body, noticing, for example, that maybe the left shoulder lies on the floor a little differently than the right shoulder. So you're doing comparison, but you're also just trying to see in your mind's eye your body and match it to the sensations that you feel of contact with the floor. And what generally happens is if, for example, one of my shoulder blades is clearer to me, I can visualize it in my mind better. It seems more connected to the floor and I can feel that connection more clearly. It probably means that I use this shoulder blade better than the other one. So it's like, I just have a better sense of it. I know what to do with it. And the other one, it's like a little stiffer. I don't have as many degrees of freedom over here. So there's a correspondence between the clarity of my image uh, of the shoulder that works well versus a less clear image and in action. Also, I'm not as graceful with this shoulder, right? And so he explains that he says the unused parts of the body are dull or mute in awareness. And again, he says the unused parts. So again, I might be right-handed, right? And so I write with my right hand all the time and I might have just more developed mental image of this hand than my non-dominant hand, which I don't use for writing. But if I had an ideal self-image, an ideal body image, what would that look like? So Feldenkrais says, I would ideally know where all of my joints were. I could feel them all. I could visualize my whole skeleton. And not only that, but all the surfaces of my body. I would just have a complete map, right? It's all there. Now, that's, again, ideal. And he points that out. He says, this is incredibly rare. But what you'll find is that if you practice awareness or movement or really in any movement practice, what will happen is if you're trying to, let's say you're trying to learn a new dance step. And in that moment of confusion, you have a sense, even if it's only briefly, that you don't know where you are. That moment where you stumble, it's like, I don't know where my feet are. And then I find my feet again. We actually use that phrase sometimes when we catch ourselves and we, we write ourselves, right? Oh, I found my feet again. But for a moment, I lost them. So I lost them in the image. I don't have an image of a certain part of my body and then I can't control it in that moment. And then, you know, maybe I fall or something like this. Okay, so at this point, Feldenkrais is going to offer you as the reader some experiments that you can do. Um, and I'll just, you can, you can hear them in the chapter, but he's gonna ask you to, and with your eyes closed, to try to figure out the distance of, from one, the, the length of your mouth, right? And so you can look at me right now, this is me, with my eyes open, putting my hands there. But if I close my eyes and I just try to feel my mouth and I, uh, I think it's about this size. Let's see how I did. <laughs> I was, I was much wider, right? This is wider than the size of my mouth. So I did that quickly, but clearly like I don't have a totally clear sense of the width of my mouth, at least just now in that quick moment, I really couldn't do it. Then he's going to have you do a thing where you're holding your thumbs out I'll just do it with one thumb, but he wants you to imagine a line from one eye to the opposite hand. And then you've got both of your hands and you're imagining this X and where is that point in space where the two would cross? And he has you try to do it and try to find it with one hand and with the other. And as you're watching me do this, you might see I'm picking different points in space with my two hands. But anyway, it's just another uh, representation for you um, that we don't quite know where we are in space sometimes. Now, interestingly, with this particular function, there, there is an awareness through movement lesson called pearls and eyes that he taught. And you're holding your thumbs out like this, and you're imagining that there's little strings going from your eye to your thumb, and you're imagining a little bead that moves along it. And I think you do it also with the same eye 
so it's not crisscrossing, but you do, anyway, you do these different things and then you move your thumbs like this and you're imagining the distance from your eyes to your thumbs and you're, you're tracking yourself through space and you're tracking your body and paying attention in a way that you don't normally do. And you might say, well, I don't need to like know <laughs> that, do I? Because I don't ever have a, but, but what you're doing is you're, you're practicing something like hand-eye coordination, you're practicing um, depth perception, you're practicing a number of things like that. And then at the end of an awareness through movement lesson like that, what happens is you, before you get up from the floor, you're lying there like you did at the beginning of the lesson and you're feeling your body and you're trying to imagine it and you realize, wow, I can feel parts of my body. I can visualize parts of my body more clearly now than I could at the beginning of this lesson. And so that is in the course of just a single class, my body image has just changed. And if you practice the Feldenkrais method over time, and I can attest to this, my ability to imagine all the parts of my body is way better than it was 10 years ago when I started doing this. And so is it ideal? No, I'm not yet capable of visualizing the entire surface, every joint and every moment, but I'm certainly closer to it than I used to be. And I can tell you that I move better, I'm more comfortable in my body. And to put these things together, I'm also happier with who I am in society, right? The change in my body, the change in my capacity to move has also affected my thinking, my sensing, and my feeling. And in a later chapter, Feldenkrais is going to go more into depth about why his method of these four elements of action, why his method focuses on movement. But just to underline here, he always had this conception that all four elements of action are being affected when we're doing these things like imagining the, the pearls moving along the bead from our finger to our eyes or whatever we're doing. He was incredibly creative. Um, the awareness through movement lessons put you through all kinds of fascinating situations, but they always involve movement and attention, right? Not just moving, but attending to how you're moving and how it feels and tracking and working with this image of the movement at all times. So in this vein, he also gives a more specific example of how someone's self-image, including their body image, could be distorted by their relationship to society. So he's going to talk about a person who he says... They, they have a swelled chest, right? It's, they look like they've just drawn in a breath. And then that's kind of how they always hold themselves, right? They're, they're swelled up like this. Well, for them, that's just normal. You see them walking down the street like this, you might think, that's strange. Why are they like that? But to them, they're like this all the time. So this is normal, right? Another one of the examples that he gave, in addition to measuring the mouth or the distance out to your thumbs, he said, can you close your eyes and, and put your hands out to sort of show what is the depth of my chest from the front to the back? And you, you try it out and then you try to fit your hands and see, did you measure it? Well, so this person who, who's like this, if they were to do this, they would, they would probably have you know, a strange idea of the size of their chest. And you can understand especially if you don't tend to have your chest like this, that if you did have your chest like that all times, which might seem somewhat unnatural, it's going to affect everything else you do. It might not be optimal. Why does that happen? Well, remember this idea that we try to project a certain way that we are on the outside to society. We live this mask life, right? And so he talks about uh, this person and they're holding their chest this way. And he says this, this image may be cut down or blown up to fit the mask by which its owner would like to be judged by his peers. So it could be that I feel like I'm projecting some kind of strength or some kind of manhood or something when I do this. And over time, just every time I'm around other people, I'm trying to be like this. 
And that's, you know, what makes me do that. And he says the image can be blown up or it can be cut down. I might, you know, maybe I have a very different posture in other situations where I feel a little, you know, like lesser than other people. I might literally walk around like this. And if I do that all the time, maybe my chest is a little more sunken, right? But this is how my conception of who I am or even who I should appear to be is going to impact my body image. And then if it becomes a habit to be in this place or in this place or any other shape, that's going to start to map into my self image, my body image, and also my self conception. So he's just going to underline that when someone is doing this, on the one hand, other people have no idea when they see the exterior of this person, how much of what they're seeing is really genuine and how much of it is a kind of a appearance that's being put on. And at the same time for the individual, he's making the point that it's the way other people see us, it's the way that other people reflect back to us that has everything to do with how we create this image for better or for worse, right? How can we improve? Again, I might want to stand up from a chair better. I might want to throw a ball more skillfully. I might want to be more comfortable in social situations. There's a lot of different things I might want to improve. Those are things we might call particular actions. But he says systematic correction of the image will be a quicker and more efficient approach than the correction of single actions. So whatever it is I'm trying to do better, if I can just get a clear map of my body from head to toe, I'm already going to do that thing better. And awareness through movement lessons that Feldenkrais taught, they, they usually did have to do with specific actions, standing up from the chair, um, reaching, rolling. Uh, a lot of the lessons come from his background in judo. He knew a lot about yoga. There are awareness through movement lessons that were based on particular yoga postures. So he does work with particular actions when he teaches, but he always works with this sense of how is the whole body put together and how is my concept of myself and how I move uh, part of the image. And I'll talk about this later. He's going to get into before he gets to lessons, kind of like what's the mental attitude that you want to have when you're practicing. In other words, what's the best mental attitude to create the possibility of changing your image? And as you'll see, it's very different than the attitude you might have when you go to the gym. And even though you might say, well, I'm trying to change my image in the gym, I'm trying to burn calories and lose weight and be trimmer. Yes, that's a way of changing the self-image, but Feldenkrais's way is, is quite different. Well, let's just leave it at that for now and there'll be more to say on that subject later. So he ends the chapter with a sort of metaphorical version of that same idea. He says, it is much easier to play correctly on an instrument that is in, in tune than on one that is not. So rather than trying to perfect this Beethoven uh, on this out of tune piano, let's tune the piano first. That's, that's the first step. Okay. so. These commentaries for me, I just kind of feel like I'm trying to update some of Feldenkrais's language into more everyday speech, how I would say the same thing that he's saying, but also to give you a little bit of a glimpse into how what he's talking about more generally in terms of how we humans function and how we change, how this is also why it's logical that he taught movement the way he did. And so as we go on to the next chapter, um, we'll get further into that. So once again, thanks for watching. If you're enjoying this, I encourage you to share these videos, especially with anyone who is curious about the Feldenkrais method. And again, if you have questions or comments um, on the book, Awareness Through Movement, again, I encourage you to get your own copy, but I will be reading uh, directly from the book in this video series. So you can also just listen to me reading it. Um, all right. Um, Thanks for being here. <laughs> I'll see you again soon. Take care.